Okay. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, no, Thank you, Kepa. And it is, it's a great pleasure to be back here in literally one of my favorite places in the world. I haven't been here in, I don't know if it's a decade, but anyway. Uh, it is indeed one of my favorite places. Now, having said that, I should give you my non-qualifications, my lack of qualifications for this talk. Can we do that one? Yeah. I mean, it'll, I could give you my lack of qualifications for any talk, actually. Any and every talk that I've ever given. Okay, so I am not a roboticist. I worked once on a robotics project. This was almost 30 years ago, actually. But not on the robotics part. So when I think of robotics, like most people in artificial intelligence, I think of the hardware platform, the actual physical device. I never, I never worked on physical devices. Well, anyway. Um, uh, so, okay, so, uh, so I'm not a roboticist. I actually was a philosopher. So I was an undergraduate major in philosophy. That's four years. In the US, it's four years. Okay. Um, I was a graduate student in philosophy for five years. And I taught philosophy in an actual accredited program, <laughs> anyway, for nine years, add those up, that's 18 years before I left the, before I jumped ship into artificial intelligence and computer science. In those 18 years, I never once took a course in ethics and happily from the students I taught for nine years, I of course never taught a course in ethics either, all right? I mean, I hung around philosophy departments, well, duh, for 18 years, I guess. And I, you know, I picked up a little of the lingo about ethics. As you'll see, very little and no understanding. So, okay, whoa. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Don't give me a hard time. Okay, so I don't know if you folks have, <laughs> I, I literally don't know. Um, if you've noticed this enormous um, upswelling of anxiety about artificial intelligence, right? lots of worries about artificial intelligence, many of them identified with really smart people. So now a couple of years ago, a, a, a really distinguished group of scientists and researchers and um, autonomous electric car makers, that's Elon Musk, Anybody who knows who Elon Musk is? Um, the guy who started Tesla. Uh, and Stephen Hawking, arguably one of the world's two greatest theoretical physicists, the other one being Roger Penrose, with whom he has written, co-written a couple of books, um, and various other really smart people raised this worry, which I think of as like you know, the Terminator, Skynet, sci-fi worry of artificial, of the rise of super intelligent artificial agents essentially taking over <laughs> us, and you know, just taking over everything, including us, their progenitors in some sense, okay? And speaking of very smart people, this is Eric Horvitz, who happens to be an old friend of mine, who is the VP of research at Microsoft. Uh, and here we go, Here's, I'm gonna read. We could one day lose control of AI systems via the rise of superintelligences that do not act in accordance with human wishes and that such powerful systems would threaten humanity. Are such dystopic outcomes possible? So utopia, dystopia, that's bad topias. Okay. Um, if so, how might these situations arise? Blah, blah, blah. What kind of investments in research <laughs> should be made to better understand and to address the possibility of the rise of a dangerous superintelligence or the occurrence of an intelligence explosion. Uh, anyway, now to me, I mean, so I'm gonna say not much about this as you'll, about this worry. I don't think it's crazy. I do not think it's crazy. I think it's, but it's a little, there are, there are other worries, more immediate, okay? So, 
But I should say just something about superintelligence because it raises, it's frankly an excuse to raise the kind of basic framework in which I think about this stuff. When I try to think about it technically, this kind of touches on the basic framework. There will be no technical stuff at all in this talk, by the way. All right, but, okay. So what's meant by a superintelligence? What's weird is these people, who, very smart people, by the way, they don't actually say really what they mean. But I'm gonna give you a picture, okay? Okay, this is like, here's a, a kind of proposed definition or something, I don't know. The ability, that is to be super intelligent. Is it, you, so you have the ability to determine the best, that is the most utility maximizing, preference satisfying course of action, given perhaps an extremely complicated multi-dimensional utility function. You don't have to worry what that means, just you know, what, what seems like good <laughs> to the agent or something. Um, in a much wider range of uncertain circumstances, that is given a much larger state space, much, much more quickly and accurately, that is to actually get close to the best, approximate the best, sometimes approximated exactly. In some cases, you can't do that, but anyway. More quickly and accurately than any human possibly could. That, any, that would be a super intelligence. Okay, that's my working definition. In the background is kind of classical decision theory about which I have serious doubts and have even written down some of my doubts, but I do think it's a very good place to start. Okay, but anyways, I, okay. So as I said, I don't think that's a crazy worry. I think it's kind of over, <laughs> something <laughs> it bothers me about it, but in a way the thing that bothers me most about it is that it gets in the way of much more immediate worries. Now there are lots of more immediate worries I'm not gonna talk about like the fact that Florida will be underwater, <laughs> but, or something. I mean, I'm not gonna worry about it, because I'm not gonna talk about it. Okay, okay, so much more immediate worries. And that is that there are already, <laughs> never mind in the future, <laughs> I mean, there are actually already, partially autonomous systems that can do lots of stuff. Computer systems that can do lots of things, and do do lots of things, just on their own, kind of. So here's a simple example, um, a real one. Large scale, high volume, wildly fast, that's not a technical term, wildly fast stock trading systems. So there was a, what was called a flash crash on the US stock market in 2012. And that was caused by one of these guys, actually not just one of them as it works out. Anyway, a bunch of them kind of getting out of control. Okay, and, but those th these things exist already. An enormous percentage of the, st of the trades on the, at least the New York Stock Exchange, I actually don't know much about other exchanges, are, are, are executed by these, they're, not, they're nowhere near fully autonomous systems, but they're partially autonomous. But there are always human monitors. They're watching it. They're not watching each and every trade. That's literally impossible. I mean, literally, you can't do that, but. Okay, there are also systems out there. These already are in place. Again, I don't know what the situation in Europe is in this regard, so this is just, but they are in place in the States, I assume. Anyway, so credit and loan approval systems. So you apply for a loan or, and you know, it's all online, and there's some algorithm or, or other out there <laughs> saying yes, no. They do not make the final decisions. At least so far, they do not ever make the final decisions. They make recommendations to humans. But, you know, okay. In all these cases, at least in principle, there are humans. Now, these, these terms, in the loop and on the loop, are quasi-technical. <laughs> That's how I think of them. They're kind of quasi-technical terms. Uh, which people use, by the way, a lot. Uh, and and they're, uh, anyway. 
Um, so in the loop, kind of, I mean, they kind of mean what you'd think they mean. So think of a multi-step action, some multi-step process. Well, if a, it, in the loop means there's gonna be a human doing some of them, <laughs> at least one of them, kind of that, right? Not necessarily the last one, that, but anyway, doing some of them. On the loop is essentially monitoring. Done completely, auto, I mean, all the steps are done by machines. No, right? no human touches them, but a human is watching. Okay, that's, okay. That distinction will come up. Okay. Now, in a way, the most striking, well, the most widely known, <laughs> I guess, autonomous type of autonomous system has got four wheels and a horn. That is, okay, that is more or less autonomous cars. All right? Uh, now, where I live, in the heart, as we say, of Silicon Valley, I see them all the time. I mean, literally, around my, around my neighborhood. I don't know if you, I don't know. We don't live all that far apart, Professor Perry and I. Yeah, I live across the poverty line. Yeah, so that's a, that is a difference. So I see them all the time, these little Waymos. That's Google's the alphabet, officially, right? You all know this. It's not Google, it's the alphabet. Anyway. Um, Okay, so a couple of years ago, I should know the answer to this when, I don't actually I can't remember. A couple of years ago, the International Society of Automotive Engineers came up, agreed to a, a characterization of degrees of autonomy for cars and, and trucks, by the way. I mean, anyway, vehicles, ground vehicles, motor vehicles. Uh, so it, it's, it's six levels, and because they're engineers, it's zero to five. Well, because they're geeks, it's zero to five. Okay, and they these are smart people, and they you know they separate. So they say, I'm not going to read this crap. I mean, you know, it's just like they thought about this really systematically. Okay, as that's the way they do stuff. And this next, you're not supposed to be able to read this. Don't worry, but you can see six. I mean, well, six because it's here. Um, here's Tesla. Right? What people are aiming for is complete autonomy. Google in particular has bet the farm, at least in terms of cars, Alphabet, I did it myself. Alphabet has bet the farm, at least with respect to cars, on completely autonomous vehicles. That is no wheel, no pedals for the, I mean, you know, maybe a big red button. They always have a big red button. That's kind of a joke, but anyway. Um, Car just does it, man. In, in every kind of condition, no matter what the weather, every kind of road, the car does it. That's level six. By the way, you should look on the website. It's, I mean, again, I, I kind of, I just, this is just a GIF, so it's like it's unreadable, it doesn't matter. Just, it's easy to find. The society, it's, it's actually, it's called the SAE, the international is left out. So Society for Automotive Engineers, the levels of autonomy. These guys, you know, they, they, they think about this stuff. Okay, those already exist, of course, to some extent. I mean, fully autonomous. The Waymos are fully autonomous. There's a human in the passenger seat. Okay, but, you know. And in Europe, well, I won't say that. I actually know a little bit of what's going on in Europe, but I won't, who cares? Okay, much scarier, <laughs> by my lights, is autonomous weapon systems, right? So. As I said, a few years ago, these very smart people, Stephen Hawking, you know, Elon Musk, this guy, that guy, other people, sent this, you know, this worry about AI, right? It's an existential threat to the human species. That's what they said. This year, they sent a letter, a, a different group, sorry, with overlap, sent a letter to the UN, but open. You can Find this on the web too, by the way. I, I should have given citations, but I'm too lazy. <laughs> it's open, now there it is. No, 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 no. Anyway, um, this was signed only, this was, on, uh, this was purposeful, of course, signed only by people who were in positions to make money out of building autonomous weapons and didn't want to. So Musk signed it, but not Hawking. Hawking's a professor at Cambridge. He doesn't make any money out of anything except maybe books. Musk 
is the CEO of two of both SpaceX and Tesla. He could make a lot of money out of here. I'll build you some weapons or something. I don't want to do it. So that's what, so only robotics and AI, only technologists from, a, many of them were also faculty members. That's how it works in the States. Faculty members get, faculty members in computer science, not many of them in philosophy, although there is one, Gary Marcus. I don't know if he got rich, but yeah. Um, right, so they make money by also starting companies. That's kind of the American way. Okay, anyway, so this is this year. Okay, so I'm not gonna read a whole bunch of this stuff, but you know, I'm not gonna read any of it actually. This was directly to the UN. So it's kind of, they wanted the UN to have essentially a, a set of hearings and then come to a, an international convention like the Geneva Convention, that's what all this is about, all this fancy talk, okay? The crucial thing is lethal autonomous weapons threaten to become the third revolution in warfare. What are the first two? Uh, yeah, anybody know? <laughs> Bows and arrows. Bows and arrows, basically. Guns. Horses and guns. <laughs> anyway, once developed, they will permit armed conflict to be fought at a scale greater than ever and at time scales faster than humans can comprehend. These can be weapons of terror, weapons that despots and terrorists use against innocent populations, and weapons hacked to behave in undesirable ways. This is, by the way, people have already shown in public, to the public, that they can hack cars. That was done a couple of years ago. So there's a, there are real security considerations. Anyway, um, blah, 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 what did I say? We do not have long to act. Once this Pandora's box is open, it'll be hard to close. We therefore employ, <laughs> employ the high contracting parties. That's, again, this is one of these UN standing committees that, you know. this is, so this is great stuff. I mean, I'm extremely happy that they did this. And, okay, now, so what's the reality out there so far? Well, there are lots of things. There are, of course, I assume you all know there are drones there are drones of more sorts than you know. Take my word for that, by the way. There are drones of more sorts than you know. And for some reason, the word drone gets applied. There's no good reason for this, as far as I can tell. Gets applied only to, as it were, unmanned aerial, what used to be called, when I was a child, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. But there are also, of course, UGVs, unmanned ground vehicles. There are USVs, unmanned surface vehicles, which we would normally call boats, and also UUGs, unmanned underwater vessel, vessels, which we would call submarines. They're all drones. And they come in bizarre sizes, enormous to literally the size of a fly. In fact, there are flies that are drones, things that look like they're not really flies, because I'm with Kripke on that. They're not flies, but they're like, they're, they look like flies. Okay, so Kalashnikov, you all know who, AK-47s, everybody's favorite, I and mean, this is true by the way, arguably the best, you know, single person weapon ever created. It was the AK-47. Okay, so here's, here's, you won't see many talks, I bet you you've never seen a talk before, maybe I'm wrong about this, which is with a quote from Popular Mechanics. This is in public mechanics. Kalashnikov has announced an, and this is, <laughs> that's the title, and then I added the subtitle. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, Russian weapons maker Kalashnikov is working on an automated gun system that uses artificial intelligence to make shoot, no shoot decisions. But exactly how this AI or any other, huh? who is a combatant and who isn't, is at the heart of a raging debate, and it is. It doesn't rage much in public but I will, it, it's raging. Um, over allowing autonomous weapons on battlefields filled with both soldiers and civilians. Blah, 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 blah. You ready? <laughs> Here you go. Oh, no, no, come on. Now, I'm not actually, here we go. I'm not gonna play you the whole thing, don't worry. It, it, this is, one thing the Russians need is better branding and marketing. There's no sound, there is sound if you, that's, by the way, you might say, why is there Korean in? That's Korean. 
So you got me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it goes on. Oh, well, it's, it's great fun. There it goes. Hey, hi, Charlie. How you doing? Uh, don't worry. I'm not going to. OK. I, I will actually get back, not to the Kalashnikov. I'll get back to the Russians briefly. So you see, so, so this is not just not a technical talk. This is actually like a policy talk in a way, which is a little weird. I have no expertise in that either. But. So, so, so is the one we just saw in the video is already the Kalashnikov? Oh, it exists. Right? No, it, it, it hasn't been actually deployed in battle yet. The Russians aren't fighting anybody directly, although, although well, well, they are. I mean, it's a complicated issue. So their buddies are fighting in the Ukraine, and yet other buddies are fighting in Syria. They haven't deployed. This weapon exists. I mean, there are other. It's the autonomous one. It's, it's, it's completely autonomous. Yeah, so it's got its own little cart. So it's a, so it's a UGV with this unbelievably powerful and fast shooting machine gun on top. OK, now, there really is a debate about this. I don't know if this makes you feel good or bad. I feel uh, good is the wrong word, actually. Um, so. The US government, in particular the US Department of Defense, which is the part of the government that counts here, has been thinking about this stuff for at least five years, in public, as it were, for five years. Um, and, um, anyway. Um, and they, I mean, they, they really do think about this stuff. And so that's Paul <laughs> Selva, General Paul Selva. Paul, to me, that's General Paul Selva. He's the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, don't worry, there will not be a test on the Pentagon hierarchy. He's the second highest ranking uniformed officer in the United States Armed Forces. OK, the second rank under the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joseph Dunford. And he's a very, this guy is a very smart dude. One of the places where we spend a great deal of time, and he's not kidding about that, is determining whether or not the tools we are developing absolve humans of the decision to inflict violence on the enemy. That is a fairly bright line that we're not willing to cross. That was last year. He hasn't changed his mind as far as I know. Um, so five years ago, so there's an entity in the, so when I say Pentagon, you all know it? I mean, it's, that's the home, literally, the physical home. <laughs> of the US Department of Defense. And, and just like the White House is, is uh, metonymic, is that the right thing? For both an actual building and a kind of institution or organizational, same with the Pentagon, okay. So the Pentagon has this, has, the Pentagon has this enormous organization with many parts. One of its parts, which is kind of special, because they were appointed for a, Two years, I think. This is the Defense Science Board. So those are not military people. Some of them are ex-military, although. But mostly they're just smart people that in, in the sciences that, they, that the Defense Department wants to hear from. Trump's going to appoint the Defense Science Board? No, he, so the good thing is, the good thing is he will almost surely literally rubber stamp suggestions from the DOD. That's the way it works even with smart presidents. They don't, yeah, yeah. anyway. OK, so the Defense Science Board in 2012 ran a summer, I love this, a summer session that's what called, on autonomy. That was the first public, first, and, and you can get it online. It's, it's, uh, the DSB, Defense Science Board 2012 Summer Institute, I think it might have been called, on autonomy. All of it, all public. So they would think about this for five years. Um, so what happens when, the, when at least, well, this is not just the US military. Is it? This goes back, I don't know. Anyway, they come up with these things called doctrines. They think about something. We would just call them policies. Right? It's the stated policies. They're called doctrine. I don't know why. But anyway. OK. So, 
So I'm going to read you. <laughs> this is a little bureaucracy, but I can't. anyway, this is, you know, this is, I'm going to read you from a DOD director 3000.09. Uh, first published in, two, I mean, first promulgated, I guess is what one does. Uh, 2012, but amended just a few months ago. Okay? So, the official definition of autonomous weapon system. A weapon system that once activated, that is, <laughs> you turn it on. It's an on think about on-off switches. This is a little silly, but in a way, it's, it's okay. Okay? That once activated can select and engage targets without further intervention by a human operator. This includes human supervised, so that's on the loop. Not in the loop, on the loop. This includes human supervised autonomous systems, weapon systems that are designed to allow human operators to override operation of the weapon system, but can select, the, these systems can, this is bad English, this is just a quote by the way, but these systems, the autonomous systems, can select and engage targets without further human input after activation. So by the way, don't kid yourself, no human is fully autonomous since for instance, John Perry, could tackle me and prevent me from continuing. It doesn't make me less autonomous. Just, it's one of those things, the way life is, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, so what the, what the doctrine governs, and again, the military is very explicit about all this stuff. That's the way they are. The design, development, acquisition, testing, fielding, and employment of autonomous and semi-autonomous, which they never exactly define. Uh, weapon systems, including guided munitions that can independently select and discriminate targets, and the application of lethal or non-lethal kinetic, always just, just think physics, it means force, <laughs> literally, kind of, you know, anyway. kinetic or non-kinetic force by autonomous or semi-autonomous weapon systems. Non so, when the U.S. engages or somebody else engages in like propaganda or you know, trying to win hearts and minds, that's called non-kinetic activity, just in case you're interested. Okay, U.S. military doctrine. Now, I'm not gonna read this, I mean, this, you know, you can get, this is all online. U.S. public, everything is public. Requires meaning, so that's the bottom line. Requires meaningful human control of any and all targeting decisions and performance of the targeting cycle. Right, there's always a cycle, think about it. You know, I mean, Okay, it's a multi-step procedure. Right. From, the, from the same directive, and this is literally, this is the header, a subheader, I thought, policy. It's gonna have all these things, you know, in advance, and then boom, policy. It is DOD policy that, <laughs> this is literally the way they write, autonomous and semi-autonomous weapon systems shall be designed to allow commanders and operators to exercise appropriate levels of human judgment over the use of force. So think again, even if not in the loop, on the loop. Effective, they can effectively intervene. Persons who authorize the use of, direct the use of, or operate autonomous and semi-autonomous weapon systems must do so with appropriate care and in accordance with the laws of war applicable treaties, weapon system safety rules, and applicable rules of engagement. Okay? And you guys, I don't, know if, I don't know if you're all from NATO countries actually, but anyway, at least the Spaniards in the group are. Um, you guys, it, it's the same. The what? S Spaniards, Baskians. Baskians, I guess, may not, maybe they don't consider themselves bound by this. But anyway, okay, so this is from NATO, Allied Joint, Tar Doctrine, for Joint, Allied Joint Doctrine for Joint Targeting. AJP, three point, anyway, blah, blah, 2008. This has got nothing to do with autonomous weapons, by the way. Sorry, I should, this is just in general. This is in general, like for people. But the idea is, and for, Autonomous weapons too. If they're really autonomous, they, they have to follow this too. While all reason, this is, and this is exactly right. If you think about this, of course. You can't regulate perfection. While all reasonably feasible care must be taken at each stage of the targeting process, again, this, this is a multi-stage process, figuring out, should we kill this guy? 
It's never yes or I mean, it's always in the end, it's yes or no, of course. But I mean, it's or should we bomb this city? Targeting decisions and targeting actions are not legally judged based on perfection because you can't do it. I mean, you can make mistakes. People do make mistakes. Or that of hindsight. Oh, you know, hey. Those involved need only take those precautions that were reasonably feasible at the time of their decision or actions and in the circumstances prevailing at that time. However, this objective standard also means that recklessness, negligence, and willful blindness provide no excuse for unlawful targeting. So, the picture that, that the US in its doctrine of 2017 wants to promulgate to all of its people is this applied to the operation, to the monitoring and oversight of otherwise autonomous weapon systems. All right? And again, it's not, a, it's not a, a regulation that says you have to be perfect and make no mistakes. Oh, no, you can't, I mean, you know, duh. But, okay, so that's, okay? Okay. Now, so, my view, so, my picture is, in one sense, these, this combination of doctrines, the general doctrine that I quoted from NATO, you can get something like that from the DOD as well. It's, all, it's the same. Just with, it's what makes sense, to be perfectly honest. It's just kind of common sense in a certain way. And then the, the doctrine with respect to autonomous weapons, you put them together, you get, so in a certain sense, it's like nothing new. I mean, it's a, you know, so you got these, it's a different kind of, so okay, so it's another kind of weapon. But you gotta use it correctly insofar as it's possible to do so. Okay, that's, that's the picture as far as I can tell. And this, this is, anyway, that's, okay. This, but, okay, now here's the problem in a way <laughs> about which I'm not, I mean, so I'm gonna take, so I think the current US military doctrine about autonomous weapons is both, I think, well thought out and sincerely adhered to. It's been promulgated and thought about, though, with a recognition that there are pressures against it. And the pressure, the crucial pressure against it is called by military folks, I'm not pretending to wear a uniform, the tempo of battle, right? And you have to think of this as just, it's, it's a fancy way of saying bad crap happens in war, <laughs> okay? And it happens quickly too, that's, that's the tempo stuff. Okay, so, and, and Pelva and all the people in the DSB and everybody's aware of this, these pressures. So, how are you gonna monitor so you're a human and you're in charge of some, uh, you know, largely autonomous, but monitorable weapon system. What happens if, as they say in the military, comms go down? Comms is short for communications. What happens if you just, you don't know what the hell is happening out there where the thing he is, and you can't talk to it? That's gonna happen. That's absolutely, it's guaranteed, essentially. Sooner or later, that's gonna happen. Okay, and of course, comms are also themselves hackable, right? You're sending out electromagnetic signals, whatever, they're hackable. Okay, and again, this is just, you know, this has gotta happen, right? And mission relevant stuff might be happening where the autonomous beastie is, stuff that, Stuff that, if the human operators knew was happening, they'd go, roughly speaking, kill that bugger. I mean, this is war, right? Let's, you know, we're not, okay? Kill that bugger. Bomb that city. Tow that line. Whatever it is. It's just, you know, okay? That's just, and war happen. I mean, not all, Wars and not all battles, but a lot of them. Right? 
things happen really quickly. You haven't got a lot of time to, well, let me think about that. Just, it's the way it is. That's what they call the tempo of battle. Especially if you're dealing with an enemy that's anywhere near as advanced, anywhere near as sophisticated technically as you are. Like for instance, the Russians. Now, I, here's, the, here's where I get back to my, I just want to say one thing about the Russians. So the US and NATO, by the way, I, I should note that um, I read the thing from NATO 2008, that was a completely general, nothing to do with uh, autonomous weapons, a completely general reminder that, hey, no one's perfect. And this is not a way of making excuses in advance because no one's perfect. NATO, as far as I know, has adopted, at least provisionally adopted, the US doctrine with respect to autonomous weapons. So I'm gonna say they have adopted, I'm not actually sure they have, but they will, I think. Um, so in public, Right? The Russians have been prodded to make their doctrine public. They refuse. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they have a bad doctrine. They just, no, we ain't telling. At least as far as I, as far as I know. Okay? So there could be really big problems. And this is not like 1,000 years from now or even 150. This is roughly speaking next week. I mean, roughly next week. Okay? Now, I want to step back. So, I hope you're all a little, not scared, but, you know, just a little something. <laughs> a little concerned or something. So, but I, now I want to step back and pretend that I know anything at all about, I know something, about ethics and stuff like that, which really, I, I don't really, any more than, that is, any more than every more or less reasonable adult knows. So, okay. So this is not like, these issues are not like the stuff, you know, the, the moral issues that arose with the, with the design and construction and use of the atomic weapons, atomic bombs. Now, 72 years ago, last month to be precise. Right? The weapons were dumb. The people who made them were smart. The weapons were dumb. They didn't do, they didn't, you know, drop them, whatever, okay? It's not like that. It's not like any, really, I think, it's, it's not like, in this respect, we're talking about weapons of a sort unlike any weapons anyone has ever built. However destructive or whatever. It's just, it's really a different kind of worry, right? Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I mean, anyway, anyway, there was a, but again, not the same kind of worry. This was like, you know, like genetic engineering, you know, again, horror stories. We have to be careful. Yes, but those were just, you know, sequences of four letters. I mean, you know, anyway. Okay, so, okay. So, boom. Um, okay. Okay, so this is got, now, but notice, let's, I also, so I do think it's important to distinguish, <laughs> to make some distinctions here. So I'm worried about autonomy, I mean, I'm worried about lots of things with respect to AI. I'm not crazy paranoid, actually, but I, there are lots of concerns. So one concern is the concern about technological unemployment. I'm not talking about that at all here in this talk. I do want to make the distinction, though, between automated and autonomous, because <laughs> people sometimes, I think, okay. So, um, what counts, I'm talking about autonomous entities. Most automation, there's almost, there's very, there's almost no autonomy, okay. Uh, it's worrisome for other reasons, okay. So, I think of, I mean, this is, again, this is amateur linguistics, right? So I think mostly automated as an adjective, as it were, um, applies, so people think of it as applying to jobs. That's actually a mistake. Think of it as applying to tasks, right? Tasks get automated. And of course, some jobs are essentially unitask, largely, like the Charlie Chaplin job in modern times, but anyway. Okay. 
Autonomous applies to agents and actions. Right? And basically it's, you know, so you ask. I mean, notice I've been using these autonomous weapon systems and I have, again, no fancy stuff by my lights. This is just the kind of ordinary way people think about it, kind of, with a little bit of theory stuck in here, but, um, right? So, so I said, no age, no human being is fully autonomous because, you know, they can't, literally you can't do everything you want to do, even those things that you're, that, that are phys you're physically capable of doing. Someone might stop you or whatever. I mean, you know, that's okay because it's autonomous to the extent that this is an old fashioned idea that comes up, of course, in talking about political science. The causes of action are inside you, <laughs> right? Like, it's like not taking orders from a central government. Is that okay? Is that okay? Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, right? So, you know, and again, this is this little bit of theory in the background. That is, you know, it's, your, your actions are, are we, we think autonomous actions are the ones that are roughly speaking caused by what motivates them. Namely, the beliefs and desires or whatever it is of the agent that does them. That's all, it's that simple. Oh, okay, yes, this is out of order. That's weird. No, 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 okay. So this is from the defense, the summer study. This is a, a, this is a recent one, June 16, June 16. There was one in June 12, I think was the first of these. Um, and they say it, you know, an autonomous system must have the capability to independently compose and select among different courses of action to accomplish goals based on its knowledge and understanding of the world itself and the situation. That, that sounds just right, kind of. I mean, it's, you know. Now there's this question about whose goals. So whose beliefs is easy? It's the system's beliefs, right? Because it's somewhere in, in some situation it's looking around or whatever it's sense, whatever the sensors are. So it's beliefs kind of, own, at least the beliefs about what's going on now are its own beliefs. It might have big beliefs about doctrine and it gets those from its superiors in just the way that human soldiers do, by the way. I'm not saying literally just the way, but I mean, human soldiers don't make up their own doctrines either, take my word for it. If they do, they get shot by their own people, <laughs> okay? But the goals, the goals, well, okay, anyway. Okay, so, very simple idea about what it is to be a more, you know, autonomous. Okay, so now think about, so here's where I get out, here's where I'm pretending to be a, a moral philosopher. Where by that I mean, I don't mean a philosopher who is moral, I can't make that, I can't do that, pretense. But a philosopher who thinks about morality, which frankly I, Roughly five minutes of my life, the five minutes that it took to, I mean, roughly. Okay, so think about it, think about the, the negative cases, as it were. That is, where we do not hold some otherwise intelligent, let's say, an agent. So we're not talking about like a table or something, we're just, you know, a person. Okay, well, there are lots of such cases, right? Non human animals. We don't, I mean, there are, Tricky cases here with respect to you, with respect to domesticated animals. But like lions, not a tricky case, is it? If, if a lion attacks a human being and eats him up. It's not like that's immoral. No. Anyway, kids. Again, there are tricky cases, but under some age, we, 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 we give them a pass. <laughs> I mean, not if they, yeah, anyway, but okay. And again, it's the same picture. It says, well, yes, the kid acted on his or her beliefs and desires, but the kid's mind isn't sufficiently matured. And by the way, there are actual honest to goodness physiological phenomena at root here about the way the cortex grows. It's age 40. Yeah, well, in my case, it's 60. In your case, not yet. <laughs> soon, though, soon. <laughs> Anyway, adults that are, you know, like significantly brain damaged adults, the tricky, so there are tricky cases about driving, you know, like, well, like driving under the influence, but hey, the person made the decision to keep driving. So we find them, I think, correct, I mean, again, in, just in general. Yeah, okay, you weren't fully conscious or f weren't fully 
autonomous, whatever you want to say, at the time of the accident, but you were when you ordered the next Jack Daniels on the rocks. I'm just, I'm, I'm just making up a case. <laughs> anyway, okay, there's a great case. I'm not going to talk about the Nuremberg case. I mean, the Nuremberg law, by the way, says, taking, you know, you can't say, no, I was just following orders. Even if it's true that you were just following orders. I mean, that's true that you were following orders. Can't, that's not an excuse. This is a great, I don't know if anybody ever, I mean, except John and I, I don't know. Anyway, so there's this, there was this great program on American TV called Law and Order, which is just like what it sounds like, kind of, you know. Anyway, and there was this great case. I really thought it was a wonderful case. So the, 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 the main, bat, you know, the, the character was a brilliant scientist of some sort, I can't remember what, um, who, who was severely bipolar. And, but was, but his condition was completely manageable, managed by taking his meds. But, there's always a but, 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 his meds just, he, 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 he couldn't be brilliant on his meds. He just, you know, his, his whole life emotionally and cognitively was kind of damp, dampened or whatever. And so he just, you know, and so, on this one occasion that the, uh, kicks off the story, he purposefully goes off his meds, goes into a, uh, a, a, a hyper uh, hebephrenic, schizophrenic, violent high, kills somebody, kills a woman. Is captured, that's easy. He did it, there's no, I mean, that, that's not the issue. The issue is, is he culpable? Is, is he guilty? Or could he plead temporary insanity? Which is what he pleads, and he and his lawyer plead. And the case, it was, it, to me, it, it was a great show, but I thought that it was easy. I mean, I do think this is easy. Maybe it's simple-minded of me. Um, but he went off his meds on purpose, knowing that there was a chance, and he did. And he knew that there was a chance that he could be violent. This is just like the guy who drinks the one extra Jack Daniels in the rocks. Anyway, so we, you know, we do have ways of thinking about these things, which are just, to me, it's kind of, again, I think of it as the application of this general theory that we have about human motivation, and we just apply it. Some, you know, some cases are tricky, of course, but anyway. Okay, so here's the general description. When the agent isn't fully capable, I don't know what that means exactly, of generating, maintaining, or changing its own beliefs and preferences, that is, isn't in full control, that's of its own rational motivation. Kind of like that, right? Something like that. I mean, again, we all know, if we think about it, actually, this gets, this gets to your thesis. We all know, if we think about it for 15 seconds, that a lot of our beliefs, that are our beliefs, come from, like, you know, the culture in which we're brought up. And we're not, it's, you can't say, oh, well, let's just stop believing that. You can't, I mean, sometimes you can, I don't mean that, but it's complicated, but that's okay. That's, that's all okay by my life. Okay, so, now, finally. So this, is, uh, that was all kind of background to my little policy, which is trivial, of how to think about autonomous agents, that's just it. My analog is kids, except they're gonna grow up. So we should train them. Literally, we should teach them right from wrong. And, Here's my, so do you all know who this is? Everybody who knows who this is, raise their hand. God, the rest of you are Philistines and barbarians. This is Bob Dylan. So Robert A. Zimmerman is to Bob Dylan as Samuel A. Clemens is to Mark Twain. Anyway, and this is just, you know, so some of us are parents, some of us are even grandparents. My guess is just the two of us, <laughs> I think, are grandparents. But anyway, you know, and you just do your best with your kids and the little bit with your grandkids. Actually, you don't do your best with your grandkids. That's a separate issue. Um, <laughs> but anyway, and literally that's my picture of how we should think about the robots we build and how people do 
we have, people are starting to think this way. Not with that silly analogy in mind, mostly. Although, I like the, I mean, I think that's really what they're doing. That's how they're thinking about it. Okay, so, let's just stipulate. I mean, this is, of course, is obviously not, in, not always true, but anyway. Let's stipulate that parents try to teach their children to be good, moral, ethical people, at least by their own lights and the lights of the surrounding culture. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just stipulating for the moment. But then, by age 18 or so, at least in the developed world, I don't know, anyway, in the US, it actually, I think it's 18, is what's called the age of reason or something like that? I don't know, I mean, literally, I think it's, at least it used to be called the age of reason. They are off on their own, okay? Uh, and, then, and then they're off on their own. You know, you can give them advice and they'll just ignore you, basically. That's what happens, by the way. I mean, you know, so boom. Right? And they, and not their parents, are held responsible for their actions. I mean, in general. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If only they were held responsible for their college debts. No, but that's a separate thing. <laughs> okay, this is, that's it. I have this very, I mean, that's it, man. That's the bottom line. That is, that's how, so there is no need for any such special discipline as roboethics, which is why I haven't read a single word. So at some point, I just discovered this year, this is, I mean, this kind of, so I've been in AI, officially, I mean, uh, for, God, I have to think, that's terrible, I have to think about it, 37 years, 30, 38 years, 38 years, after my 18 years, I should, get, I should have given the test. How many years was that? After, you know, nine years as a philosophy professor or something. I, and I never even heard, I mean, I knew what the phrase roboethics would mean if it meant anything, because it's easy to figure out. I never even knew it existed until this year when people in the DOD asked me to think about some of the, roughly speaking, asked me to think about some of this stuff. I said, Jesus, there's this whole thing about, I'm not gonna read that. I haven't, I haven't read a word of anybody. Because I think, as far as I can tell, there's nothing special, literally. There are technical issues, deep and interesting technical issues about how you teach robots to be good little robots. As opposed to, okay, what's the name of J.J. Abrams' production company? Do you know who J.J. Abrams is? Oh, come on, come on, really? It's, he was, he's the director of the last really good Star Wars movie. And his production company is called Bad Robot. I mean, this is culture that we're <laughs> talking about. I don't know, what's, anyway. Okay, so my view is, and this is literally my view, which people think, this is great, what are you? Anyway, but I, no, this is my view. There are no ethical problems, either substantive or meta-ethical, unique to robots or to artificial systems more generally. They're just the same ethical problems. I mean, what you do to punish them is a different story. That is it. how you teach them. That's interesting technical stuff, which if you want, I can talk about, then it gets technical. Inverse reinforcement learning is a, it's a good way to start. Okay? But otherwise, you know, there, there's then, yeah, there are issues about, well, how do you punish these things? Well, punish, don't think about punishing them. Thinking about changing their behavior. So this is completely non-retributive punishment. If you know what, that's one thing I noted. I mean, that is the, there's no, you can't have a motivation of, you know, to, to make the guy, to make these bad robots suffer for their badness. That this doesn't make any sense at least by my lights. That which is a good thing, to, that's good. Anyway, despite the above, which I really do believe, it may be that AI will create, maybe we've already created actually, I'm not so sure about that, but may, I think we will create actually, a new kind of, in one sense, moral agent. One that is not also a moral patient. So what I mean by moral patient, I simply mean a critter that is deserving of moral consideration. Okay, so it's okay if I kick this, the leg of this table. I mean, I could hurt myself, but anyway, who cares? I can't go around kicking dogs. Dogs are moral, I think. You, you really can't do that. 
I mean, you shouldn't. It's immoral to go around kicking dogs. Dogs are moral patients. They can suffer pain and feel pleasure, and, right? Where that, you know, we're in the animal kingdom, that line is, that's, I'm not, I have zero idea. I'm not, you know, my guess is it goes down very low, as it were, or something. Uh, anyway. uh, that's my guess. Um, so, and we oftentimes, we now, I shouldn't say we oftentimes, take that back. We have come to think about the earth, the environment, as a moral patient. It's worthy of moral consideration. It is not a moral agent. Mother Nature isn't actually out to get us, although she has damn good reason to do so. Right? She's not blameworthy for all these hurricanes. Actually, no one's to blame for the hurricanes, for the severity of the hurricanes. We are to blame, as it happens, I think. But, okay, so, so there are lots of moral patients which aren't moral agents, right? But as, until AI, there were no moral agents that weren't also moral patients. I think we're creating a new kind of entity. We're creating lots of new kinds of entities in various dimensions. But with respect to ethics or morality, we're creating a new kind of agent. And that's it. That's, that's my bottom, that's it, done. So there were no clarificatory questions, which means everything I said was crystal clear. And it must be said, there was certainly no technical <laughs> complexity in it, that's for sure. So, are there any non-clarificatory questions? <laughs> That's the idea. Um, but um, so, on our theory of harnessing information, <laughs> yeah, you have a very simple. We have a very simple but utterly compelling picture. Right? You harness information of a mouse trap. <laughs> mouse trap is not a moral agent <laughs> or patient. <laughs> so, yeah. so you have a system. Yeah. That that uh, uh, gets information, and the information causes action that has results. And then you, to make sense of that, you have to say, well, it, the, the action caused should be successful given the information. And, and then the question And is, given some criterion of success. Exactly. Which is most of criterion of success. Now, well, where does that come from? Well, you say, well, Mother Nature. Wanted us to survive. Well, that's bullshit. Yeah, it God, is. well, you know that that's what's more pious. <laughs> uh, so I've been thinking about this ever since we worked on this. And it seems to me now you just have to say, well, that's that's what a value is. Yes. A value is that for which it, 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 it is it is it is something such that given information and action, it all makes sense. So that is kind of my view, by the way, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, given that perspective, volunteers, autonomous agents just kill us. No, generate generate <laughs> their own values. Yes. Based on which whether the yes Kalishnikovs survive and and spread throughout the world, or the or the, the Israelis, I'm sure, are doing something, or you know. Yes, the that, answer. So, so, so notice, in general, the robots. Yes. Is that, is that okay? I, I think you will. Um, Which I, so you're going. You you went a little too fast, but but the intermediate stopping point is right. So notice, if you remember, I didn't ever answer the question today. If you remember, so I quoted this thing about uh, from uh, the DoD about blah 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 the goals. It's. Uh, not its goals, it was the goals, its beliefs, because it's its beliefs, that, let's say that's okay. So I actually asked the question, whose goals? Whose goals? Well, so I'm gonna, I mean. The goals that explain the propagation of. Not, not the species, no. No, 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 see that's, so, so. Here's where the case, this gets complicated, but again, I don't think it's like completely different from the rest of life or something. <laughs> anyway, so think about an actual human soldier, 
a real, you know, a regular human soldier. Um, but not a very high rank, <laughs> okay? Uh, anyway, they're given missions. They're given jobs to do. Now, sometimes it's peeling potatoes. That's at least in the American army. It used to be peeling potatoes. I don't know. You know, just that is crap work. I mean, you know, junk work to do. Is, is that like... Is that supposed to be a, a, a goal that the soldier adopts? No! He adopts the goal of obeying orders because otherwise he pays some penalty. That's, and the, 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 anyway, who knows what goes through the soldier's mind? There might be soldiers who really like to peel potatoes. They get real satisfaction out of it. I don't know. Who knows? Who cares? I, frankly, exactly, who cares? In the military, don't matter. Literally, it don't matter. There are, there are higher level goals officially set by, as they say, the civilian authority. That's a little worrisome in the present case in my country, but that's the idea, right? So it's civilian control of the military. They set the highest level strategic goals or something. And then you get generals and down to, Private David, who's, you know, who has, I don't know, yes, sir. <laughs> now, of course, when we think about these people, we think, well, but they've got kind of goals that are like independent of the military. Take my word for it, the military doesn't care. They understand that one of the goals is that, that the guy should stay alive, but that's also an, a kind of minor level instrumental goal for the military because they like to keep their soldiers alive. It just helps. <laughs> anyway, so, so there's not really a, now, okay. These guys, my, my robot friends, they're gonna be given missions. They're not generals. We're not talking about robot generals. That may come, <laughs> but at least for the moment, let's not worry about that. So they're just gonna get, here, take this mission. And by the way, I, you should know that there are things very like this. Now, America, outside of, I mean, the US at the moment, outside of Afghanistan, is not involved in any <coughs> significant shooting war. We're giving weapons to lots of people who are, but we're not actually involved in any other war. There are, there have been kind of experimental, what, are, what believe it or not, are called, hybrid units in Afghanistan. That is people and robots of certain sorts. Not, fully, not, not very autonomous, but anyway. Uh, so, so that's just another one of the crew, <laughs> you know, just looks funny or something, whatever, right? So you don't worry about its goals. It, you don't, I mean, it, it just do the mission, man, do the mission, that's it, right? Now, it can generate its own, what we might call, sub-goals. And the more intelligent it is, the smarter it's going to be at generating sub-goals. Right? So if it's on its, so think about cars. So now go, for the moment, leave the military situation, go to just the cars. So the human, humans, it's humans who decide where they want to go. The car doesn't care. I mean, it, it would just sit there, I don't know, do nothing. I don't know. I mean, literally. Right? So the human says, okay, I want to go from A to B. And the car, I'm speaking now about the whole car, so including the navigation system, it decides the best route. Right? And by the way, they're much better at it than most people are 99% of the time. And they get lots of information about traffic, so they know about, so it's like, so, so this is Waze on steroids, if you know Waze, right? So, so they generate their own sub-goals. And it just as John said, it's got nothing to do with, with, with what makes them feel good. Nothing makes these cars feel good. Robots will not be feeling good and bad. That's not the issue. It's that they're, they're, they're going to be specifying conditions such that if their beliefs about the world are true, which they might not be, of course. I mean, they, you know, they're not. I mean this, but if their beliefs about the world are true, relevant beliefs about the world, 
than the actions they plan to take and actually execute will satisfy certain conditions. And the satisfaction of those conditions is what it is for the actions to have to be good actions, that is to contribute to the value of the robot. We're, that's got nothing like eating chocolate ice cream. It's just meeting certain conditions. And the, the robots, just like people, can recognize deviation. Whoops, that was really a bad way to go. It's not like everything they do will automatically meet the criteria of success that are in some sense intrinsic to their, to their own planning. It's, no, they'll just like, just like people, although the more intelligent they get, it'll happen less often, I suppose. It'll be, so it's their goals. Again, with respect to, but there's nothing magical here with res, because when they're in the military, they will be getting goals from above as well, just like everybody else in the military, except for the guys at the very top. <laughs> right? So just, just like more of the same. So the general picture, which people, by the way, when I, so people, I can, I mean, this is in some ways, I, when I, I think this is, some people find this shocking, <laughs> but uh, anyway. The general picture is there's nothing special about robots, although they may, they might take over and kill us all, by the way, that's, but that's the, that's the thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about that yet. But otherwise, hey, just think of them just the way we think of our grown-up kids, <laughs> some of whom go to war. Yes? Well, I'm sympathetic with what you say, but it seems to me what one of the questions, which comes up as far as I know it, and I know close to nothing, about the super intelligent guy who speaks about AI taking over the world, etc., etc., what they have in mind is not the kind of automatic, automatic robot take idea from above, or call from above, above, from human being, if I have the time and we come to yes. set up their own book and to do so we sort of became self-conscious or something like that. No, see, yeah. a problem. No, as, see, yeah. as least as I could understand. Yeah. No, very good, very good. So this is something I didn't want to get into. I mean, the part about self-consciousness. I, I actually didn't want to get into that. But so with respect to generating their own goals, as I say, to me there's no difference between generating sub-goals and generating goals. Sub-goals are goals, yeah. right? And at some point, you, look, this happens to people as well. There are people who, for whom certain sub-goals become much the, the satisfaction of the sub-goals. The way one does something ends up being more important than the original goal for which it, for the satisfaction of which it was a sub goal. It's going to happen. Why not? It'll happen to them too. I don't know. That, so, uh, so, so, with respect to this, to the cognitive architecture of these creatures, I think of them literally as just like us. They have to be trained, taught. Again, the way they're trained and taught will be quite different from the way we train and teach not just our kids, but our young soldiers, if we stick to the military story. And they'll, but they'll generate their own goals, just like everybody else does, kind of, uh, kind of. Um, but you know, they'll take orders. Again, this is, okay. Now, there are people, I, there are people who think, no, 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 but the real worry is if they become self-conscious. Notice I didn't use the word, I didn't use the C word, consciousness, never mind self-consciousness, at all. This is one of my bugaboos. I think it's, there's, there's nothing to it. Uh, I, all I mean by, there's nothing special to it. Consciousness? Self-consciousness. I don't think there's anything special to consciousness, actually, either, really. Um, I, I could go on about that, but because I realize, huh, what do you mean? I mean, I'm not talking about the distinction between being, a, between being deeply asleep and awake. There, there are, there's a, there are physiological differences that are measurable. I'm talking about 
consciousness as it's, so I'm talking about conscious as it's used as an adjective on certain states or processes or events in the mind or somewhere. I don't think there's anything, I mean there are some, I'm not denying that, it's, I don't think there's anything special about that at all. Uh, as it happens. Now, but there is this bit about self-consciousness. So won't they, but again, I think it's just like kids. Really, I'm not kidding when I say that. You know, occasionally one's kid probably wants to kill you. <laughs> your, your kid probably wants to kill you for like a second or two, I, one hopes, just not very long. But yes, they certainly want to, they certainly want to grow up and be on their own. Well, these things, that might happen a little. I agree, that might happen. I'm not worried about that for the, I mean, I'm not kidding, by the way, when I said the original worry that I pointed to by Hawking et al. That's not a crazy worry. I just think that's like, let's not worry about that first. I'm not saying let's not worry about that. Let's not worry about that first. Let's worry about like stuff going on literally now. So yes, robots could come. It's not unimaginable. If we, teach, if we don't teach them well, that's why I teach your children well. Remember, I should have actually quoted the, that's Crosby, Stills, and Nash or Buffalo Springfield. Anyway, teach your children well. Buffalo, Buffalo Springfield, I think, is right. Which, of course, was mostly Crosby, Stills, and Nash. But anyway. Um, uh, this is songs from the 60s. That, um, so uh, that's my picture that, you know, yeah, they, they'll become super, I do think actually, by the way, that super intelligence, I mean, unless the, you know, unless we kill ourselves before they have a chance to, <laughs> I actually do think super intelligence, the way I characterize it, loosey goosey, but yeah, I think that's in the cards, by the way. I, that's gonna, that's in the cards. Um, but you know, so we, you know, our kids grow up to be more powerful than we are. Just, hey, you should be, you know, kind of be nice to us. So, so, I, so I know I, it sounds like I'm trivializing important concerns. I think all of the really important issues end up being tech, this is my general view about almost everything actually, <laughs> except love, I guess, anyway. Um, all of the important issues end up being technical issues really, about how to teach these critters, which are very different from us in certain ways, of course, but where we know about some of the differences, because we created them, how to teach them to be good robots. And that ultimately is a technical, there are technical issues. Huh? I'm not saying what it counts to be a good robot, that I'm gonna let the society, as it were, determine, whatever that means, but. How to teach them at all, I mean, how to teach them R. So this is what I talked about, inverse reinforcement learning. That's a matter of learning R utility functions. All right, learning what it is that benefits us and trying to, so they have to learn that, just as kids do, by the way. They'll learn it in different ways. Um, and learning to, to to take that into consideration in their own actions. Now there are some people who think, so there, are, there is some technical literature on this, it just started by the way. There are people who think you can, one should think about this in what I call an, an, a naturally cooperative game theory. So cooperative game theory is where, you, it, let's say it's two person, I mean two, I shouldn't say two person, two party, two party cooperative game is so it's exactly not a not it's exactly not a zero sum game that is where both parties can win something okay in an interaction but they each party of course has its own independent utility function i mean you know, just, they can both do okay if they blah 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 right um, uh, so there are people who think that it, that's a good model for thinking about robots as do i i think to some extent that's a good model Except there are, some of these people think that you should model the robot as having no independent utility function. Essentially, its only utility is maximizing my utility. It's 
right? I think that's not a good way to think about it. We don't, I mean, anyway. It's hard to think about what the utility, how to model the utility function, by the way, for reasons that, in a way, John was, I mean, that, that, it is hard to think about it in abstracto. Because, huh? But in concreto, if you know what I mean, that is that. Oh, oh, okay, I see. Anyway. John. <laughs> so you, you, you've made the case that robots uh, will generate sub goals. Yeah. And those are goals. Yeah, but now. Sub goals are goals. Now, won't they also generate higher level goals? For example, you've got robot planes that go around bombing factories. Right. And then through a mutation, which could be some programmer's idea, uh, you've got you know one kind of bomber that will not bomb factories near near kindergartens. No, will not bomb factories that produce it. Oh yes. Now those will propagate in the population faster than the ones that are going around bombing their own <laughs> factories. So. So what, what, what's the value that explains that use of information? Well, the value that emerges is not killing or not destroying your own back. Now, I don't know if that's a very good example, but it does seem there's this possibility, not just a yeah. figuring out lower level goals no, no, that, no. that are helpful for your goal, but also generating your own higher level goals, which might be worrisome. No, no, I agree. I agree. Oh, I, don't, I, don't like I don't like thinking about this for reasons that I could get into, but I don't like thinking about this li in literal, kind of literal, Darwinian terms. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't like, but, but, I agree, but, and that aside, I agree. No, they will, just like kids, mm -hmm. right? They will, they'll get some goals from us, just like, you know, I mean, some goals they'll adopt, I guess, I don't know. Anyway. And then they'll have some, you know, they'll, they'll generate some sub-goals, and then they'll figure out connections between sub-goals and these higher goals that they inherit from us, and they go, oh, if I change this goal that I got from mummy and daddy engineer, I can adopt these, these successful practices that satisfy these sub-goals to satisfy that goal. And yes, it's all, I mean, that's going to happen. Oh, again, I'm predicting. Who the hell knows? But yes, they will generate. I didn't mean to, when I said sub goals, I don't mean to say not ultimate goal. I have no idea what, I mean, I have no idea what people mean when they talk about ultimate goals. I don't, I don't know quite what that means. So I don't have that kind of hier hierarchy in mind much, but yes. They will generate their own goals just like our kids do. <laughs> it's a little scary, that part, but anyway. Yeah. So I was thinking, that following with the analogy between the robots and the kids, no? Yeah. So in the same way, you said that we can start thinking about robots as non moral agents. No, no, no. No, no. Uh, as moral they're, agents. Well, they're, they're, they'll be. They'll, yeah. They'll do good and bad things. Okay. We'll say bad robot, good robot. So I was thinking in thinking about kids in terms of robots. Oh, wow. So yeah, that's okay too. The idea was <laughs> uh, we don't punish kids because we don't consider them no. as are you parents? Are you, are you no, parents? no. <laughs> one, one does sometimes punish one's kid. What, sorry? One does sometimes punish one's kids. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, so I well, But the state doesn't. I, I, I was thinking in, in that sense. Yeah. So in that case, kids uh, will be some sort of uh, Moral patients, but not moral agents, will be considered as yes. moral patients. No, that's not exactly moral right. Agents. Until some age, and the law, weirdly, well, not weirdly, the law in different places says here's the age. So yes, little kids are moral patients. You can't just go around not just kicking dogs. You can't go around kicking little kids, but they're not yet moral agents. 
So I was thinking that not in a in a in a legal way, but I was thinking in, in the case where some a couple goes to the restaurant with their kids, yeah. the kids start playing, yeah. the kids are, yeah, horrible. And the ones who get punished the parents. are the parents. Yeah. So you punish the parents, yes. for the parents to talk to the kid yes. to, to yes. behave yes. yes. So in the case of robots. No. <laughs> I, I was thinking, in the case of robots, what would happen? You punish the monitor, you punish... Oh, well... So we, 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 no, no, very good. Very good. No, no. So again, no, no, you have to... So this is partly my doing. So I focused on autonomous weapon systems for because they're just... I mean, I, I do think this is a real current issue and it's a real current... And which... You know, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, um, so there, again, what would happen? It would, it would depend. This is just like, in, this is in real life, by the way, at least in the US military, it depends. <laughs> sometimes, the command, sometimes the commander of a of a of a, a a bad platoon, let's say, not just uh, even a single guy, by the way. But anyway, sometimes they'll be held responsible for inadequate monitoring, or sometimes not. It depends. That's the same is going to happen with robots. I think it's just the same. It happens also with soldiers. If they uh, yes, that's what I meant. Yes. So it it I mean, and responsibility for good and bad is not. It's it, it's shareable. You know what I mean? I mean, you can, you know, you get 10, I mean, I don't mean it's shareable, but yeah, you get 10, you get 90%, you know, whatever. That's exactly right. With respect to, but with respect to kids now, yes, when, so again, this gets into technical issues, but that's okay. I'm not gonna dive into them, but, so, like the kid at the restaurant, right? If, if it's a little kid, you know, pretty, I mean, you know, so we're not, I mean, there's, again, there's some age where, blah, 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 but that's, you know, it's a little kid. And the kid is just being obnoxious in this restaurant. And the parents just, and this happens in real life, I mean, right? The parents, oh, isn't he cute? <laughs> and, you know, you'd like to punish the parents. The parents really don't get punished, although they might be asked to leave, I don't know, or something. You know, they're responsible. That's, they're held responsible. Yeah, they, they get punished. Exactly, probably, probably, yeah. They do get punished I'm later. Thinking in punishing that, uh, yeah. Embarrassed. yeah, no, exactly, yeah, they, they suffer Not some, legally, okay. no, they suffer some consequences. Yes, when it comes to training these robots, the trainers, who will be people like me, well, that's, that's maybe not the best way to, but anyway, I mean, they'll be kind of, you know, research scientists and engineers and stuff like that. Um, so what actually happens, this happens now with respect to machine learning systems, right? Is that they get told, not really, of course, but it's as if they get told, bad decision. That's not a cat, that's a dog, right? You all know about the cat video recognition thing? Yeah, it's kind of boring, but still. Right, you have to get, so that's what's called supervised learning, supervision. Mm -hmm. And you have to get told the robot doesn't, you know, again, not a robot, it, it is a robot in this more general sense. That the, the machine learning system, it doesn't know what the hell a cat looks like until you say, that's, that's a cat, that's a cat, that's not a cat. All right, now, the robot, the machine, suffers, suffers zero, I mean, there's no suffering involved. But yes, the humans are responsible if you're doing supervised training, now it's a weird kind of responsibility, but it's real. If, if, you, if you design badly a, a training regimen, whether supervised or unsupervised, they're in, but then, and, and the machine ends up just being an idiot, then you're responsible, right? And that could be the case you know, there will be, I think there will, so there will be cases in which 
human designers, builders, designers, whatever they are, will be held responsible for especially serious errors by these largely autonomous systems. So now think about the most famous case so far, I think, I don't know, anyway. The Tesla, the fatal Tesla crash in Florida. Now, I don't know, do you want, like to know about this case? So first, like you know about the Tesla? So, yeah. right, so this, is an, this is what Tesla calls autopilot. It's a level three autonomous system. If you actually look at the, uh, I'm not gonna bring up that slide again, which you can't read anyway. Okay, so what happened, so, so the guy was driving, so there are a lot of idiots out there driving. This is a given, yes, human idiots. Mostly the idiots driving are human idiots. So this guy was an idiot driving. That he died doesn't bother me, frankly. I don't, you know, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't bother me. So he was driving on a road. He was driving, he was using autopilot in a, on a road of the sort that he, that he was explicitly told he shouldn't use it on. So it wasn't, it was what in the US is sometimes called an interrupted, I think, highway. That is, it was not so, highways, you know, and you get, you know, there are, there are exits, I mean, there are, sorry, accesses, sometimes, usually from the, in, in the US, and I guess in Spain, because you drive on the right side of the road, um, there, are, there, are, you know, there are accesses from the right, occasionally from the left, but no one goes across the road. Right? At least, I mean, there could be crazy people, of course, but you know, you're not supposed to go across the road and it ain't easy. Because they're often divided in such a way that literally you just, you can't do it. Tesla's autopilot is explicitly limited, and the drivers are told this, to um, regular highways, okay? He was driving on a highway which allowed Cross literally, legally, it was cross traffic. Okay? And the system had not the, the vision, you know, no, I, I won't go, I mean, the system, doesn't matter, the, the system as a whole hadn't been trained much. I'm not saying not at all. That's why it was, it, it, there wasn't significant focus on driving under conditions in which it was not supposed to be used. And that's what happened. A, a truck, a white truck, a large white truck, went across, drove perfectly legally. Well, whether it, the particular maneuver was legal, I'm not even sure I know the answer to that. But in general, perfectly legally, you could drive across. Um, uh, and this jerk was showing, I mean, this jerk was, you know, uh, anyway, and boom, dead. Okay, that's what happened. Now, who's to blame? Now, my own, so as I said, responsibility, praise and blame, can be, is, is shareable, intrinsically, I think. I mean, shareable. So he was most to blame, I think. But Tesla was a little to blame. In particular, and, and for a couple of reasons, which they kind of don't like to say. So Tesla, are, although they've changed, the software has been changed in this regard, by the way. Not yet to accommodate interrupted highways. Or highways with, that would, that's a much bigger job. But to be more, one up front, to be more explicit, when, literally when the car is sold, as it were. You know, they have this like, you know, a CD or whatever it is. And you know, just, idiots, don't drive, blah, 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 blah. Here's what you're supposed to, here's the only conditions under which it's okay to use autopilot, okay? One. Second, to be more aggressively obnoxious with respect to reminding drivers to keep their hands on the wheel. That's the other thing. You don't have to keep your hands on the wheel all the time in autopilot, but you're supposed to, every once in a while, show that you're alive, right? And, and, and the idea is, be more obnoxious when, when the idiots aren't doing what they're, what they're supposed to do. Right 
they've thought about, so people have thought about the following. I'm not sure that Tesla is doing this yet. I'm not sure they will do it. That's a separate issue. But anyway, I'm, I mean, that's, that the, that's a bigger issue. So people have thought about the following. Um, if you have some human who's, so, is an enormous problem, it's called the handoff problem, right? It's between car and human, not between human and car. So the problem is you're driving in one of these, you know, you're the driver in one of these things, and it's been on this highway, it's just, you know, the kind of road for which the system was built. And every once in a while, you put your hand up. I mean, you know, whatever. But really, you're paying zero attention. That's OK. I mean, I'm not saying it's OK, but that's, that's OK. And it, of course, knows where you're going. And it knows that there's an exit, the exit that you, you, you want to take, whether you know it or not. Anyway, there's an exit. It's like 10 minutes up ahead at, at, at current speed and blah, blah, blah. So many of these cars, current, do I know the facts here? I'm not sure I do. Some of these cars will say, jerk, you got 10 minutes before we get to your exit and you have to take over, so wake up. They don't say that, unfortunately. If I had my way, that's what they would say. In something like that tone. <laughs> But anyway, and then and if you know if the guy doesn't you know if the person if the driver doesn't give evidence that he or she is ready to take control, they say it again or whatever it is. Now there are some people. I, so I think I'm not, I'm not supposed to say any of this because this may be proprietary information. There are some people, some car people, who are saying no, no. What we're going to do, if at all possible, is automatically drive to the side of the road and stop. Just. Forget about it. We're not going anywhere until you take over, right? And there are other, there are various things. That's the handoff problem. Because that is the problem is that the driver, you, you just have to assume that the driver will not really be, as it were, au courant. <laughs> I mean, won't be whatever the, you know, won't be like really alert. Even if awake, I mean, mind you. And even with the hands on the wheel, won't really kind of have um, be attuned to his current environment, which is changing at like you know 120 kilometers an hour or whatever it is, right? So, and that that's one of the re that's the biggest single reason that Alphabet Waymo has gone for completely autonomous driving, because they couldn't figure out a good way to solve. They think they think I know people at Waymo who think. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And I know other people who think this too. There's no good way to solve the handoff problem, especially as you get beyond level three. Who's, Never mind. Who's Alphabet? Way more Alphabet is the, is the parent company now of Google. They created this. So, and Waymo is a subsidy, wholly owned subsidiary, <laughs> which makes cars autonomous, which anyway. Um, so, so whose fault was it? Uh, no, in that I, case? I, I guess that's because I think that. So the engineer, very, very, I'm sorry, that was, that was a long digression. Because this is something I thought about a bunch as it, that case as it happens. But so yes, the designers could be, I mean, the company, I, I'm not worrying at the moment about legal issues, although those, those are real, of course. I mean, but yeah, let's say the designers and engineers they should have, oh, you know, uh, some idiot's going to drive this on a highway where he shouldn't be driving it. And we should be much more aggressive, never mind telling him in advance, we should be much more aggressive about doing what we think is right. Talk about goals that even, you know, I mean, what we, now this is people, of course, think is right for our stupid customers so that they won't get killed, right? You know. Anyway. No, the thing is that since the idea I got was that there is not a new ethical problem. No, it's, it's not, that's and, not and a I new thing. It's not okay, a, you know, I don't think I, that's I a new thing. I am allowed to think as a normal ethical problem. So I think that every human usually looks for someone to, to, to blame. To blame. <laughs> and I was thinking if you cannot punish the machine, someone is going to look always up for someone to blame. No, so, no that's very I, good. Very good. 
So up to a point, that's right. But there'll come a point where it'll just be wrong. That's just it. At some point, when these, when, when these critters, whom I'm thinking of literally as like our kids, right? they're still in infancy yet. And this is not a matter of literally how old any one robot is. It's how old AI robotics is. <laughs> it's, that's the, right? We're still in the infancy. But we're going to build devices that will, like our kids, be best thought of as essentially independent critters making their own stupid and smart decisions. And we won't, it'll, it'll make no sense to blame the designers. In I mean, I'm not saying it'll never make sense to blame the designers, then, even after that happens, because there are, you know, but. Um, that's, yeah, that is my pick. It's, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say it's just there's no new ethical issue raised. It's just the same as we've always had. I'm easy. No, it's, it's the same topic, really, but if, I mean, what I, what I was going to ask originally was what's the difference between a moral agent and a malfunctioning machine? Huh? <laughs> That's a, uh, why well, is that? What's the difference between a tomato and a um, moral agent and a malfunctioning machine? Uh, I'm not quite sure what the question is. You've got this category of moral agent. Yes. So no. Some the, kind of characteristics. No. Uh, so all I mean. So this is again. I'm an amateur at this talk about ethics. All I mean by a all I, literally, all I mean by a moral agent is an agent, I mean literally all I mean, is an agent that we think of, if you like, I don't know, anyway, I'll say, that we think of as acting autonomously and hence subject to praise and blame, including moral praise and blame. That's all I mean by a moral agent. You're one. I'm one, I'm just, I'm just my, f my f almost 40 year old daughter is one, but she wasn't when she was seven. No, no, I understand, I understand that our attitude to that. the, to the uh, agent is, is different, I understand that. No, from, so from what, different from what, different from what? Uh, different from, to a machine. No. My, at, at the moment, it, it is. I agree, and it should be. Yeah. No, what I'm saying is that we're going to build machines. Take my word for it. Yeah. This is true. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to build machines such that the, the, the right way, the only plausible way to think about them, I mean, just the, it'll, they'll demand to be thought of, as it were, I don't mean literally, although, as moral agents. There is no such machine yet. I mean, there'll be, decision, there'll be complicated decision-making agents without yes. any interests, which is well, central no, to the idea they're not moral patients. No, no. So this is this here. I, I defer to the bearded gentleman in the second row. Actually, what I really envy John is his hair. He's got it. He's got some, and I don't. That really ticks me off, by the way. Anyway, so. But look, it, I mean, it's. If your lawnmower malfunctions, you get mad at it, but there's something irrational about it. Yes. Does it really any different if your robot malfunctions? Doesn't... No, I think, no, yes, it is different. Oh, yes. Yes, it's, it's different. Maybe. It's different. <laughs> it's, no, it's different. If your robot malfunctions, again, I'm not talking about current robots, but this is not, I'm not talking science fiction either. Honest. <laughs> I'm not talking science fiction. Um, uh, yes, if your robot malfunctions, you, again, depending on how it malfunctions, but yes, they will, in which it's perfectly reasonable to be angry at it. It doesn't make any sense to punish it. It might make sense to retrain it. So I'm not talking about re-engineering it, by the way. Mm -hmm. The engineering is your fault. So there, there, there are tricky issues here about what's, how shall I put it, in the hardware and what's in the software. I'm talking now about the software. 
The, I think the point is that if there's an intervention that's available to people in responsible for the machine, yeah. then we will either expect of them that they intervene, or we don't. Yeah, now if again... not... Well, see, so again, let's just separate two issues here. So let's go back to the official US DOD military doctrine. The doctrine is that if one of these autonomous systems, let's say of the nearest future, never mind the far future, the nearest, nearest future, looks like it's going to do something really it shouldn't do, then you press the big red button. Yeah. And if you can and don't, you, the human, is liable. I mean, is uh, something, 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 yeah, yeah. responsible. Okay. That's right. But I'm, I'm talking about situations in which, let's stick to the, let's stick to the war fighting case. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, that's what I meant. After it's done something undesirable. Yeah. After it's done something undesirable and you couldn't monitor it, you just, you just, um, you couldn't do it. Then, now, but then there are different, so just like with humans, there are, there are different possible causes for the malfunction. It could be, as it were, a faulty belief, let's say. Literally, let's, I mean, and, and that can vary. I mean, that is the kinds of beliefs involved can vary. So it could be a current sensory belief. Sorry, there's a case, I could show you a picture actually, of, um, of uh, I don't have it, but I mean, there is a picture, <laughs> so I can't actually show it to you. But anyway, of a, a two little kids with rifles. I mean, they're toy rifles, right? Uh, and they're pointing it at some people. And man, it sure looks like those are real guns. That's a, that's a real problem, by the way, now with some of the toy guns. They look like real guns, right? Um, and people have thought about that case, you know, if there was like a RoboCop, literally. I know that, that's the name of a movie, I know, but anyway. Imagine there was a RoboCop, and just in the circumstances, the only way to stop them was to shoot them. Let's just say, I mean, just given that. Whoops, sorry, it was a mistaken perceptual belief. Okay, well, really think about it. Well, I don't know, what are you gonna do? So you might, you know, work a little harder on perception, okay. Et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that is, um, the thing is, these systems, so something I haven't said here, because it, but it's in the background, maybe I should, I mean, with respect to the software, these systems are going to be significantly developed via machine learning techniques. So yes, they're programmed, but they're programmed to learn. They're not, they're, they're not given detailed online action execution determining programs. You know what I mean? So, okay, bring it back and let's retrain it and see if we can do better. Really, it's just, I mean, that is, <laughs> I don't, I mean, just like with people, except again, not really just like with people, but at some level of abstraction, just like with people. That's, that's my view. That's no, I, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, okay. okay, I think we have to finish here. So, okay. okay. So be nice to your robots. <laughs> I tell that to everybody. Be nice to your robots because...